Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, it is Shay here, and let me tell you, this was a fun interview. So you are going to be listening to a conversation between myself, Ian Wheel, and Nick Jorgensen. And so what we're going to be talking about is we are going to be having a beef supply chain discussion, but we are specifically going to be focusing on the commercial cow calf producer and how they can leverage their role in the beef supply chain, as well as the seed stock supplier and how the seed stock supplier plays a role in helping the commercial cattleman or cattle woman really put more money in their back pocket, as Nick will say later in the episode. But with that, as you are listening to this episode, one thing I want you to think about is what makes your calves valuable to the next segment of the beef industry? What makes, if you are a seed stock provider, what makes your calves valuable to your commercial cattlemen or your commercial buyers? If you are a commercial cattleman, what makes your calves valuable to the backgrounder, the feedlot, um, the packer, the retailer, the consumer? Just really think about what makes your calves valuable. Now with that, remember that once you're done listening to Go check out the description or the show notes, and you will, there will be links there to both um, the breeder website as well as Nick's website as well. So be sure to check that out. With that, let's visit with Ian and Nick. All right. Well, Nick and Ian, I'm excited to be here with you guys today and to have a conversation about the beef supply chain and specifically talk about those commercial cow-calf producers and the seed stock operators, because that is my main audience. And I think, well, we all know they are so important to actually getting beef all the way through the supply chain as the beginning. So before we dive into that, let's start and I'll have each of you introduce yourselves. So Ian, let's start with you. Can you share with the listeners a little bit about yourself? Hey, well, Shay, thank you for having me first. And yeah, so as you'll tell by the accent, not from around here, but do live in Texas now. Um, originally off a cow-calf operation in Australia, producing yearlings, but spent a number of years sort of working with retailers and in the supply chain as well. And I now have set up a company called Breeder a number of years ago, and we've been in uh, operating the U.S. for a few years now and really started to grow, helping build supply chains here in the U.S. and working with cow-calf operators to be able to produce better cattle that go into supply chains. And really the focus of our business is individual cattle data. We have a ranch management app that can help people improve their operations, but then using that data to build supply chains on the back of that, getting data feedback back to those cow-calf operations so they can improve over time. And so, yeah, based in Texas, but operations throughout the US now. And um, yeah, it's great to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. And Nick, how about yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Nick Jorgensen. I'm the CEO of Jorgensen Landing Cattle uh, in Ideal, South Dakota. Uh, we're a fourth generation, actually fifth generation uh, family operation. Uh, main thing we do is we're a seed stock producer. We raise black Angus bulls. We're actually the largest seed stock producer in the United States. Uh, in 2023, we merchandised just shy of 6,000 bulls, um, whether through private treaty or through auction or through our lease program uh, across the United States. So, you know, that's that's the main thing we do. And we're starting to work with customers more and more on um, what we call genetic consulting, uh, working with them on understanding the genomics of their cow herds and, and how they can you know, use our genetics to help better their cow herds. And additionally, it's it's working with folks like the folks at Breeder to help kind of leverage our network, so to speak, uh, to, you know, stand up strong, resilient supply chains that help that cow-calf producer get a little extra money in their back pocket, hopefully at the end of the day. Well, I think we can all agree that that's something we want as cow-calf producers. So, you know, whether it's Ian or Nick, whoever wants to talk about this, but tell me a little bit more about how you're working together. Yeah, perfect. Well, I think, you know, we met a while back, but, you know, what we're, from a breeder perspective, we've been here to help ranchers and, and producers build supply chains. And, you know, what Jorgensen's built over many generations is a really good reputation for producing really good quality genetics and really collaborating with their commercial cow-calf operations. And, that's a fantastic starting point to build a supply chain. And um, we'll talk about that in a bit, but it's 
you know, how do we how do we actually take that um, starting point, but then really expand on that value through the supply chain so that those animals can help produce better profits for the feed yard, they can help produce better profits for the packer. And then how do we get that value to sort of track all the way back down the supply chain? So we're working both on the data collection side with Jorgensen's and I'll let Nick talk a bit about that, but, you know, but also working to help build out buyback programs and and help get data back down to those commercial cow calf operations so that they can really see the value in Jorgensen's bulls every time they lease them or buy them and, and through the supply chain. Yeah, and you know, from from our standpoint, Jorgensen's land and cattle, there were the, the two main things Breeder does, you know, standing up supply chains and then data collection were both really exciting for us, you know, to, to hit on data collection first. Um, we run our own genetic evaluation with Soetis. It's a it's a herd specific genomic evaluation, and, and what it takes to run one of those is an immense amount of data on genotyped animals, genet genetically tested animals. And um, you know, it's one thing to to have lots of animals that are tested. It's another thing to accurately and efficiently collect and and you know get all that data aggregated. And we struggle with that for a lot of years. And that's where, where breeder kind of comes in to help us, you know, in the field, collect data from our own herd or from our multiplier herds uh, that raise bulls for us uh, and, you know, just more efficiently feed it into our evaluation. And then from a supply chain perspective, um, being the largest seed stock producer in the United States, we have presumably the largest pool of, well, commercial customers and therefore, uh, you know, commercial calves that are born in the United States, we estimate it's it's north of 200,000 calves a year that are born out of our system in some way, shape or form. And, um, you know, we've been trying to wrap our heads around for several years. Well, how do we, uh, you know, help our customers take advantage of that scale, right? And leverage that into, you know, buying power is the wrong word, right? But how do you leverage it into power in the marketplace uh, and it was finding a, a partner like Breeder that specializes in something like that, that was, um, you know, an exciting thing for us. Yeah, that is very powerful to be able to take all that data and have it in one place that's easy to use, if anything, because data is super important, but we have to be able to use it and access it. So with that, I want to talk a little bit more about the commercial cow-calf producer and what role they play in the beef supply chain yeah i think you know in the just from my side of like in the past you know a lot of the cattle that have been produced on commercial cow calf they are you know the starting point without good genetics you know you don't end up with a supply of cattle and so we've seen that in the last few years where the commercial cow herd has dropped off and we're starting to see a reduction in supply but the other thing that we're starting to see is really a demand from retailers um, and food service for consistency and quality and all that starts with the the seed stock and the commercial cow calf operator but you know the calf is born on the commercial cow calf operation and for that to improve and to optimize and for as a beef industry for us to produce a higher quality product that earns everyone through the supply chain more money we've got to work with those commercial cow calf producers to help them you know cull their cows appropriately improve their herds get better genetics and really produce the cattle that then we can start focusing on like genetic expression but you know you have to have those genetics in there at the start point and i think the the benefit that we see with like the jorgensen's network is you've got a good basis um they're really wanting to improve year after year and then what we're bringing through the supply chain is the level of feedback that can help them improve in two or three years instead of what took 10. and so i think you know the, for that commercial cattleman, you know, getting that data back is invaluable to improve weaning rates, quality, pricing, everything that they have to do. Um, if you can prove your cattle will go 50% prime every year, there's money in that. I can assure you. So Now, I appreciate that, Ian, and um, commercial cattlemen, they hold such an important place in our industry. Now, Nick, what is the role of the seed stock producer in the beef supply chain when you think about your role? You've alluded to it a little bit, but let's touch on it a little more. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and obviously we're talking to an audience of people here that at, at some level understand the cattle industry, right? So I'm not trying to offend anyone when I make a pretty simple analogy, but, you know, just think about um, it's gardening season, right? Um, if you're going to raise a garden, you got to plant seeds, right? And there's someone that raises those seeds. And if you go to someone that does a poor job raising those seeds, what's going to happen? Your garden's not going to be very good, 
right? Um, you're not going to have plants that germinate well. They're not going to produce well. Um, parallels exactly what we do um, in the as a seed stock producer in the industry. It's our responsibility to make sure the seeds that are planted in the garden of the of the commercial cattleman space of the industry are are good, right? So we at our ranch raise little to no beef whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the only beef we raise are the bulls that make it through our system that aren't good enough to to actually be bulls, right? The ones that we don't want to put out there to propagate their genetics. So, you know, I view our our spot in the industry as it, it sets the stage for the beef that is ultimately consumed by the consumer indirectly, right? It's not it's not the direct decision that's made, but it's the the one right before it, the indirect decision that just sets the foundation for, you know, the beef that ends up on your plate. And for so for sure, you know, when you look at it from a from a sheer scale perspective, that commercial cattleman has a much larger impact from a numbers perspective uh, in the industry. You know, it's probably somewhere north of 95 percent of of operators are commercial cattlemen. Right. But it's those five percent or less of seed stock producers that really do influence or the genetics that are that are propagated out there right so we take that very seriously because if we do a poor job here at jorgensen line and cattle we make a bad decision that ultimately influences you know somewhere close to north of two hundred thousand, close to a quarter million calves a year big mistake right and, and we can't make mistakes like that which is why we rely heavily on data and on genomics and actual measured performance in our herd and our multipliers and all the data that we can get back from our commercial customers to make sure that we're making the right decisions at that seed stock level so that the beef that ends up on our plates or your listeners' plates is as good as it could possibly be. Yeah. The, the bit I'd add to that, Nick, when we're dealing with the commercial cattlemen is the seed stock guy, producer is often, not guy, but guy or gal is often the, the person who is the closest advisor on genetics as well. So they're no longer, you know, maybe they were just a bull salesman a while ago. They're now producing sticks of semen. You know, they're the advisor they'll speak to in terms of what I should be matching from maternal versus terminal herd. So, you know, the seed seed stock producer is they're such a big influence in the industry. Like you're not talking to your feed salesman to try and work out your genetics. You're turning to your seed stock supplier. And, and it's just super critical that they are engaged in the whole supply chain. I appreciate that comment, Ian, because that actually, you know, it, yeah, we, we we market bulls, right? But a large amount of the work that actually goes into that is figuring out what kind of bulls need to go to each and every customer, right? And we can have those conversations, just the three of us, you know, Shay, we can talk about your cow herd and, and what you think you need and, and what you feel you need and how you think those cows should perform. We can also leverage genomics to kind of short circuit that conversation and say, yeah, you might think you need this, but really the genomics show that you, that, you know, you need to focus on this. So, you know, it's balancing that real world observation to the data that we have from genomics to, to, to optimize, you know, the mating decision that's made at the commercial cattleman level. Yeah, that is absolutely true. So a little bit on that. So I grew up in the seed stock background myself. Um, but my husband and I are predominantly on the commercial side, right? Well, this is our first year. We did um, genomic testing on our replacement heifers to decide who to keep. It was a game changer when it came time to go buy bulls, because like you said, what we thought we needed wasn't exactly where we needed to put our focus. And it really, it just having that extra data, we had more confidence in making decisions that were going to help us be profitable. So with that, I mean... Let's talk a little bit more how com about how commercial cattlemen can leverage their role in the beef industry and kind of take advantage of the position they're in in the beef supply chain. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot that they can do, I think, but, you know, there's certainly hurdles for them to take advantage of that. So, you know, gone are the days, there's a lot of people that would have just bought the cattle sort of on reputation in the past and, you know, but I think to actually leverage their position, it, the times now happening where producers, cow calf producers are getting better at AI, they're getting better at data, they're better at understanding their own value and and where they go. And you, you're seeing more people. And part of what we do with the supply chain is helping some of those cow calf producers retain a level of ownership, maybe not 100% through the supply chain. But the more they understand the quality of their own cattle through genomics, through um, performance that they're doing, 
then the more they can leverage their own position. And, and that may be retaining some ownership. Um, it may be just selling into a supply chain year after year where they get data back and they know they're getting the value that they deserve for those cattle. Um, but, you know, it does require a level of sort of interest or intrigue or change in terms of, you know, what you're producing, what you're capturing in terms of data. And I think that doesn't have to be huge. It could be just, you know, capturing the genetics that you've got and, and then, you know, some weight and some performance that goes with it or getting some carcass feedback through joining a supply chain like what we're talking about today. So, you know, that'd be my position, but, you know, they certainly, they're also really good insights for sort of seed stock when you can start getting more progeny, you know, Nick can learn from real data that's coming out there. So mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of things that they can do to be a, an integral part of that genetic performance improvement and, beef industry, you know, full stop. So when you say join a supply chain, can you talk a little bit more, maybe share some examples of what you're referring to there? Yeah. So I think, you know, for a commercial cow calf producer, you know, if you're working with Jorgensen's, then there is automatically a buyback program you're signing up to. You don't have to sell those cattle through that buyback program, you know, um, but if you do sell those cattle through those buyback programs, then we'll start to give you information when they hit slaughter will start to share some of that information back to you we'll start if you're doing genomics test or we'll even start to work with you on what your cow culling should be and how your terminals are working so you know that is a benefit to being part of a supply chain it's that you know collaboration produces the best results in our perspective and you know this is about everyone sharing in the upside of what we can do through collaborating and it's not vertically integrating like let's be very clear this is about vertical collaboration and how do we collaborate through the industry to actually make the beef industry better and and so you know that is work with Jorgensen's on this stuff you know then that automatically gives you access to another marketing opportunity to be part of a supply chain or an ability to us to help you start to retain ownership of some of those cattle and we actually have the ability to, you know, support you through that where maybe it's only 20% ownership, but it's something that you start to think about how you retain that through the supply chain. Yeah. You know, the other, the other benefit that I'll, I'll mention, you know, as you talk about joining a supply chain is when you look at the kind of the, the macroeconomic situation that a commercial cattleman is in is they are generally forced to be a price taker, Right. It's not a perfectly competitive market like maybe you'd see in the grain industry, right? Because there's lots of people, lots of commercial cattlemen that have found a way to differentiate themselves and create a little added value. But at large, you know, commercial cattlemen are, are price takers. You don't have a lot of bargaining power, right? You might have a thousand cows or a hundred cows or 2000, but in the grand scheme of the beef system, that's pretty small, right? And in the grand scheme of a large packer, it's also pretty small. When you take your your individual small amount of bargaining power and, and put it together with that of 500 other producers or 50,000 or 100,000 other head of animals, you all of a sudden become part of a unit that does have power, has a lot of power and can start to negotiate, right? And we can negotiate, well, Ian, you talk about all the time, negotiate grids, you can, you know, negotiate other kinds of, of favorable purchasing options, which is to me is probably one of the, the biggest benefits of being part of a, of a system like that is it creates additional value for you that you wouldn't more than likely be able to do yourself. Yeah. And because cattle aren't good, right. It just becomes a scale thing in the market that we're in. And, you know, that's important on both sides, you know, for a packer or a retailer to be able to have that consistency that comes through, like there's a reason there's a value in that, you know, there's a story that goes behind it. There's improvement that happens. So, you know, if you're part of that supply chain, you're only going to be 20% better than everyone else again in five years time. Like you're getting data feedback, you're getting information that lets you just continue to diverge from the rest of the pack. And you've actually, you know, you're helping produce something that retailers and packers want, which is a consistent product that can be day in, day out producing high meat quality, you know, at sustainable um, performance that goes through with like high welfare and also like a marketing message that goes with it. Like it's very important that the cow, the American commercial cattleman is a big part of the marketing story of the beef industry. And so being part of those supply chains, it's not that you're just negotiating because you got more cattle, you're negotiating because it's actually what the packers and the retailers want is that quality of beef. It drives shopping cart spend. It, it drives the story. It drives the price. You know, all of those things are things that the packers and retailers can then on sell to be able to drive their own revenues. And, and that's important to think about how do we help them, not just try and, you know, be adversarial because they are our customer at the end of the day. 
I, I appreciate you saying that because I was just about to ask you, but um, you just said it. It's about knowing as a commercial cow-calf producer who your customer is. It's just not sending your calves off and then they're gone. It's knowing why they're valuable, who they're valuable to, and connecting with that. Yeah. No, absolutely. Which I think a lot of, as Nick, as you alluded to already, a lot of commercial cow-calf producers are have been finding ways to diversify for years, and they're already working towards that. But I think sometimes... We almost need a reminder every now and then just because of the way the supply chain works. But Nick, you know, you already talked about, in a sense, being a genetic consultant to your customers, that commercial cow-calf guy or gal. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the role seed stock producers are playing in helping their customers find those places in the supply chain, leverage their position, um, get their cattle in the right spot? Yeah, well, I mean... It the perfect example, in my opinion, is, is what we're doing with Breeder, right? You know, as a seed stock producer, we're positioned with our five or 600 customers to, to, to largely know the type of genomics that are going out. We know 100% the type of genetics that are going out into those herds, right? Because the bulls are coming from us um, to the degree that, you know, we have customers testing their replacement females or their cow herds. We know the, the bottom side of those pedigrees as well, right? So we start to have a really good sense of the kind of animals that are coming out of this system, right? And we know we know where those calves are born. We know generally when they're born. We know roughly how many. Um, we know the, the quality of all those calves. So we're positioned really in a spot to talk to, to folks like, you know, like Breeder and say, hey, you know, look, there's there's 75,000 calves coming out of the Southeast between, you know, these months, you know, there, there's, as you start to build supply chains, an individual customer inside of our system doesn't know that information, right? They know they're a part of it, but they don't have access to the larger picture because they just, there's just no way that they could, right? So I personally believe the seed stock producer is in one of the best places to help advise on a supply chain because they get a sense of, you know, all of their customers and not just, you know, the one producer trying to stand on them, not that they couldn't, right? Um, but there's a little bit of an information advantage there too. And then the other part is we we really can work with each individual customer and we do actively on helping them move the genomics of their herd where they need to be. And, and like what Ian was mentioning just a few minutes ago around working with retailers or packers to say, hey, what kind of product do you want, right? And if, if a retailer comes and says, hey, we want, you know, beef that does this, this, and this, well, a seed stock producer can take that all the way back to their breeding decisions and to their consulting decisions that they have with their customers around, hey, you know, we've got a, we've got an interested party here for these calves. We just, we just got to make sure that they do this, this, and this. And to put a plug in for what we do specifically, we market such a high volume of bulls we have a large amount of bulls that can do just about live, that can do everything that a, that a retailer could want. You know what I mean? So if, if retailers come and say, hey, you know, we, we need to see more efficiency out of these cattle, just as an example. Well, there's, there's a subset of our bulls that can absolutely do that. And you use genomics to match those up with the right cows uh, in those cow herds. And it's slow, right? That's the one problem with the beef industry is generational turnover takes time, right? But two to three years later, hey, we've got that product. It's here. Oh, and by the way, maybe we weren't intentionally doing it before, but just by accident, we're also making a ton of beef that you want already. And here's where it is. Yeah. And you can, I think the exciting thing with genomics and data that's starting to help is like, if a retailer came to us and said, we wanted to do this 20 years ago, it would have taken us 10 to 15 years to start getting that supply through. It now takes us, you know, we can go find those cattle now using genomic testing. So you can have it within six to 12 months because there's already cattle in the supply chain, but you can start to get even more consistent within two to three due to like, you know, breeding and everything that starts to come through. And I think that's where like people don't realize how fast this industry is going to move over the next 10 years. Like it is really just accelerating um, every year. And, you know, with genomics and with, people like Nick and Jorgensen's and, you know, what they're doing on the consulting side is just as exciting um, as everything else. And I think, you know, that's, and we've got people who like people want beef, you know, peak, peak, peak vegans over and people have come back to beef and they're really interested in the beef product. And, 
people know that quality helps drive overall consumer spending. So, you know, it's, it's super important. You know, the other thing, Ian, and I, I'm jumping around here, so I apologize, but, you know, back to kind of the value of a supply chain too, is people want beef for sure, but any kind of beef that has a reputable and, and true story behind it, right? Like, Hey, this is a system where we focus on this, this, and this, and that philosophy holds from at the retailer to at the commercial cattleman to at the seed stock producer. And you can kind of tell that that's that story that has value to the end consumer, right? Where you can make them feel like they've got a closer connection. You're not making them feel they truly do have a closer connection to where their food is ultimately produced. That has value. Yeah. Right. And that's what's, that's, I think another really cool thing about having a seed stock producer involved is you've already kind of got a system there that you can tell a story about, and it's just linking it up with a retailer that also cares about that same story. You can't do that with, and no offense to this marketing mechanism, but you can't do that with cattle bought out of a sale barn, right? Because you don't know anything before the sale barn. Really hard to tell that story. And sorry, Shay, I know you've probably got more questions. But... No, you're good. I like this conversation. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the other thing that it sort of comes from that and, we don't see it at the commercial cow calf producer because we're slightly detached from it. But one thing I can assure you of is like the big food brands in the world are still very, very interested in sustainability goals. And, you know, that's not disappearing. And how do they turn the dial on sustainability? And if you look at a report by the UN and FAO, you know, genetics is the biggest driver of sustainability improvements that can happen in the cattle industry over the next 10 years. And, you know, there's other things, welfare, nutrition, you know, medications and preventative health and all those sort of things are there, but genetics are the biggest. And, you know, how do you do that in the time that they want it to happen to drive their sustainability story? They We talk about continuous improvement all the time, but that continuous improvement we talk about has to accelerate for them to feel that we're hitting their goals. And that in, that's where the cow-calf operator has a huge amount of input into that and, you know, and has a role to play in that future because the genetics start with them. That's where they're born. Yeah, I really appreciate where this conversation is going. And while we are, you know, really talking about the supply chain aspect of it and getting those commercial calves in there, are there any specific, I, I don't want to say requirements, but, you know, we talk about, you know, uniform calves, um, you know, maybe certain health protocols or like, what would be the list there that maybe commercial cattlemen want to see or have in place? Like, or do they, maybe a better question is, do they need to have certain things in place before they can get into these supply chains? I guess, what are your thoughts there? That was kind of a jumbled up question, but I think you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, look, from my side, it's, you know, I grew up on a cow-calf operation where we didn't have all this stuff when we were growing up. Like, we've, I'm a cow-calf guy at heart. Like, this is about taking people by the hand, not you would do that, but, you know, you know, and guiding them through the process. And I think, do people have to have anything in place? No, they have to be inquisitive and wanting to change and wanting to learn and wanting to get better and wanting to have higher weaning rates and making more money. Um, if they want to do all that stuff and they're, they're ready to do that stuff and they see that as a commercial part of their business, then that's all we really need. Um, yes, you need a mobile phone app, so have a smartphone, not going to lie, or a tablet that you could work with. Um, but, you know, that's not something that's been, uh, we've we've designed the technology side to be super simple. You know, how do we make it as simple as possible to put data in? How do we make it as easy as possible to put data in? How do we make it as easy as possible to get started? You know, we will, probably the only requirement you'd have to think about is how do you tag these cattle? Um, they have to be tagged. There's no doubt about that because um, that's how we link the data back to you um, afterwards. But that's the only real requirement to get started and everything else is mindset. Yeah, thank you. That last comment, Ian, was what I was going to hit on. And that was it was mindset. And I, I need to be really careful how I say this because I don't want it to come off the wrong way. But traditionally in the beef industry, right, you've got a set of people there that are largely very independent. That's a positive thing. Don't get me wrong. They, they, they do a lot of stuff on their own, right? And they've been raised to be independent. The mindset shift is, you know, you want to be a part of a supply chain, earn some more dollars, be part of a system. It might require 
changing your perception on how independent I need to be, right? Or how independent I should be, right? And it probably is going to require admitting to yourself that, hey, having input or being part of a system where maybe I have to do a few things differently ultimately will positively benefit me, right? I, I'll be honest. I know a lot of commercial cattlemen that, that say, you know what? This is my product and you're going to like it. I don't care what you want. This is what I got, and you're gonna and you're gonna buy it. I, I, you see that a lot, right? And that that's okay, right? But to be a part of a system like this, it requires cooperation from everyone involved, right? And so that you know that be that the mindset one is one that I think, um, you know, commercial cattlemen probably are frankly, if some will struggle with the most, is is getting past that. I do everything on my own, and now we're working together for the benefit of everybody. Well, and in some ways, I don't know that it's independence so much as understanding that you can still be independent while collaborating or that collaborating actually in some ways allows you to be more independent if you're yeah. leveraging your own position. Yes, it might require changes, but that's in any business. That's not just the beef industry. That's in my business that I'm doing outside of the ranch. That's everything. Collaboration is, it's critical to maintaining your independence in some ways. Yeah. And, you know, we're not forcing anyone to do anything in these supply chains. You, you know, you have to want to be part of them. You can try them. You can go back You can sell half your cattle at a sale barn. You can do the half through a supply chain. You know, th this is not a case of saying when you're in, you're hundred percent in like we're not, people have to be able to make money and they have to be independent. They have to work out their own business decisions. We're just adding an option. And we think that option will help give them better returns over time um and better weaning rates and better value and better price and better visibility of what they're doing to direct what they need to do but it's just an option that's all it is so nick you have already shared examples of how your customers are already working with the supply chain um do either of you want to share any other examples or talk more about how people are already becoming a part of supply chains and seeing those benefits you know, maybe maybe in the context of, of working towards setting up a good, strong supply chain, you know, one of the things that I'm sure is abundantly clear by now um, is that, you know, we feel very strongly about the ability to make genetic improvement, right? And leverage things like genomic testing and data collection to, to do that. And we've got real world results there that, that show you can make progress really, really fast, right? And so, this does fit into the context of right, you know, hey, if, if we've got to if we've got to make a certain kind of beef, right? How fast can we really get there? And the answer is it does not take very long. We've got we've got a specific customer that has leveraged our really leaned into the the genomic consulting. They they test all their anim, all their animals, all their replacements. They leverage genomic testing to pick replacements. Um, they leverage genomic testing to help mate bulls. Right. So they're all tested through our valuation. So we can very accurately pick which bulls should should be with which animals, both from a from an artificial insemination perspective, as well as, you know, a natural cover perspective. And we've been able in the last three calf crops, we've made a 20 percent improvement genomically on those calves. Which we went into this three or four years ago, knowing we were going to be able to make some degree of improvement. But the fact that we were able to make a 20% improvement in that shorter period of time was, frankly, it was astounding to me. Um, and so it really re it feeds into that comment that Ian made around this industry is going to change fast. And I think it's going to be able to change a heck of a lot faster than people would logically or historically we've even seen. Right. And it's just because we're leveraging those tools and we can we can move the needle very quickly. Like I said, I, it, we've seen a 20% improvement and, you know, in the calf crop that out of this specific customer was was below average um to to one of our to one of our top producing customers in in really only two two calf crops where we um really leverage genomics yeah. which is impressive extremely impressive to me and then i think you know as you take that and you take it down the supply chain the things we've seen that there's probably three different case studies that i've seen but you know just connect, capturing that phenotypic data or aim some sort of phenotypic data at the cow calf operation and how that actually then helps the feed yard to sort and it helps the feed yard to understand what it should feed well 
And we see that sort of adding value automatically through the feed yard in terms of being able to track, drive feed conversion, you know, actually get the profitability, like year on year, improve the profitability of those animals. And some of that's just due to like animal health feedback. You know, we had some challenges here. What could we do? But then you add genomics to that and we're seeing sort of 50 to $100 feed in improvement in terms of cost of gain that you can start to put in because you can sort even better and then you take that through to the packer and the retailer and it's like okay we're now stepping up our prime rates from six percent to fifteen percent and you know we had that's a huge step up and you know actually the biggest step up with a lot of the packers we work is um, taking the select from 15% to 2%. That's actually what really drives the return for those guys and being able to take that select animal out because you know most retailers don't have select on the shelf anymore. It's it's disappeared. The consumer taste has moved on and it's it's choice and above and you have to be able to deliver that. So that you know, yes, there's a select market, but you know, how do we get rid of that and how do we have consistency that goes through? And so you put that together like you know, just some level of phenotypic data that comes from the cow-calf operation into the backgrounding and how you improve your sorting, but then you add genomics to that and the ability to sort that out. And then year on year, you add the genetic gains that Nick's just talked about. You can just see how like those supply people are in a supply chain versus those that aren't are just going to continue to diverge from a performance and growth. And look, that's exciting for those people that want to embrace it. Not to say everyone has to embrace it. There's plenty of ways to drive a cattle business and you know scales another one and you know there's lots of things that can be done it doesn't have to be doing what we do but we just see this as a huge opportunity for that commercial cow calf guy or girl i i appreciate all that and nick that is very impressive over the past four years that 20 percent increase you were talking about now in today's market do you think it's really possible to leverage our role as commercial cow calf producers without keeping track of some data. What are your thoughts on that? So if you're not tracking your data, the guy that's buying your cattle is. So, you know, I would suggest you want to know that. And, you know, so, you know, you don't have to, you can let them have all the knowledge, but, you know, there is an element of tracking some of it yourself and understanding what performs, what doesn't perform, or even feeding some of your cattle through just to know how you're doing. Like these are great opportunities for cow calf opportunity guys at the moment to really understand what levers have to pull. So look, I'm a data company, so I'm always going to say, you know, and we do it in supply chains. I'm always going to say that and I am biased. So, you know, I don't want to do that, but I do know that people have a lot of data in this supply chain, but it may not be you. And, you know, how can we help you have some of that data and make those decisions? I think that's why I'm so passionate about the data through the supply chain and the vertical collaboration. There's, I mean, there are, there's niche ways to do it, right? You can, you can direct to, to the plate, market your own beef, right? You can maybe raise organic, you can raise natural, you can do that kind of stuff. But at scale, at large, right, most commercial cattlemen, you've got to have that data because if, if you're not pulling on the data lever, just like Ian said, the guy buying them is. And so if you want that leverage, you've got to have that information. But, you know, even within organic and, and HTC, I mean, and HTC even more so, you need to know the animals that are going to convert because you don't have the hormone shot to help drive them. So like that data is even more powerful when it comes to NHTC. And, you know, same with organic, just because you're feeding them organic, it doesn't mean you don't want to um, increase your weaning weights by 20 pounds on average. Like that's still $60 ahead in your pocket. So, you know, more at the moment, but yeah, it's like really important part of like understanding how you drive your business. So with that, can we talk a little bit about how commercial cattlemen can determine who their ideal customer is? and which data points then they should maybe focus on because sky's the limit with what you're going to collect. So yes. talk about that a little bit. I'll talk a bit about supply chain. I think it gets a lot more technical when you get into the genomic side, but you know, just in terms of capturing weaning weights, like by a sort of contemporary group year on year and being able to understand that in terms of how you're improving it, I'd say is the starting point. And that's like an individual weight as you sell those animals, like the ability to do that and then analyze that and be able to break it down by contemporary group of those calves, even if you're not matching it to the genetics or the genomic SNPs or anything like that, 
really, really important. Like, how do you exclude the ones that are, you've given two shots of Draxon because, you know, it was sick and, you know, it skews your numbers and you could have done a better job? Or how do you look at your mortality rates that are going through and where they're coming from, from what pasture or what, you know, issue that you may have had? So there's just a lot of data you can collect. And I would say that individual weight as you sell the animal is the number one thing that you got to start with. Um, and you can do a lot with that. Then you can start thinking about genomics and I'll probably pass on to Nick, but like once you start to think about genomics and it's becoming a lot more cost-effective and, you know, that becomes really, really exciting, I think, from a commercial cow pass. But I'll, Nick knows that way better than me, so I'll pass it up. So I'm actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sandwich Ian's comment. So I, I agree, individual weights are great, but you have to take a step back and say, all right, well, but what do I, what stage do I have to have set for an individual weight to mean anything? Right. And what is that? You have to be individually identifying your animals. Right. And as a seed stock producer, that that sound, we do that all the time. But there's a lot of commercial cattlemen that don't. Mm -hmm. Right. Calves don't get tagged. Cows don't get tagged, which, once again, I'm not knocking it. Right. But if you really want to make improvement, um, it's understanding individually how those animals are performing. So then you then have the ability, especially leveraging a tool like like breeder, where you can start looking at your cows and saying, hey, which of my cows are the most productive, right? And maybe I don't care. I don't give a hoot about supply chain stuff. And I'm not worried about, I'm worried about weaning weights, live calves and weaning weights. How do you know that that 11 year old cow out there, if you're not taking your animals, has been your most efficient cow? I mean, everyone says the, the best one is the one who's been around for 13 years. How do you know that if you're not actually tracking and what if you found out that half the year she comes up open and she just, she get calves that rob off her and she's not doing you any good. Or her calves are small and they sell with the late bunch. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Right. So individually identifying those animals and then enables you to leverage those weights you can collect into actually making decisions with them. Right. And then on the other side of that is you start breaking into the realm of, you know, understanding genomically testing those animals. And then truly, you know, looking at, well, yeah, I know this, this cow and she's, she's raised these calves, but what if I could have caught that one that didn't at replacement half her time, rather than five years down the road, realizing, oh crap, you know, she came up open one year, her calves were 25% underweight the rest of the years. What's the point of having her around? If you could have caught her when she was a year old and, and never kept her. Yeah. And, and really, you know, Cattle are a normal distributed curve in terms of performance. What we're trying to do is cut out the top bottom 10% every year, you know, and people have been trying to do that, but how do you track that? And I think the exciting thing about the genomics is you can track that before they've even had a calf. You can actually start to make, and it's, it's not to say you have to use genomics hundred percent. You can sort them on phenotype, you know, test the ones you want to test. So you, and the cost of it's coming down. You don't have to go test everything. You know, there's ways for you to try this with your, first year heifers and like start there and then gradually ramp up. And I think that's where we're seeing, you know, the 20% gains that Nick's talking about it, it. You know, it's just starting with your replacements, working out, you're getting that right. And then start to think about what your culling strategy is. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the value of the commercial cow calf producer, the value of the seed stock provider and their roles within the industry. And we've touched on what, breeder is and how it kind of plays a role in all of this. But Ian, do you want to touch a little bit more on how ranchers are using breeder today in that app? Yeah, definitely. I mean, at a most basic level, it's an inventory management tool, right? How many cattle do I have and who are my females and who are my calves? And, you know, you can store them in breeder as a group lot, but I tell you, there's no value to it. Like it's, it's nice to know your inventory numbers, but it doesn't help you improve as much. But you know, we're, we've got an app that links to an EID reader that you can, if you have a reader, you can scan it. If not, you can type it in um, and do your ranch tags. It can link to a way head as it comes through the chute. So it makes it super simple. Like, you know, that ability to capture inventory and make that so easy. You know, one of the, the ranches that Nick works with, he's like, that saved me 45 minutes a day in capturing some of the data I wanted to do. Like, that's time he's spending with his wife and kids, or he's probably actually both buying more cattle because he's a rancher, but you know, he's a, yeah. you know, that's time that he gets back. And so, you know, at the heart of it's that now you can push it as far as you want. We can do genomic sorting. We can include the genomics in, we can do B 
phenotype downloads. If you're a seed stock producer, we can put it into Zoetis or the Angus Association, whatever you need. But, you know, it starts with just really simple, easy to use inventory management. And then all of the supply chain stuff just folds off the back of that. And I think, you know, we'd, it doesn't take a lot to get started on this journey. I will, you know, you you say it's, it is a simple and easy to use app. I've been using it myself. It's saving me a lot of time as well, wrapping up with calving season and having those numbers. And you have a lot of nice features on there as well. And obviously Nick is able to leverage it as well. Well, yeah, and I was just, I was going to say, so at the simple level, right, it's, you're right, it's inventory management, but I think what's really powerful about it is its ability to integrate across the supply chain, right? So if you really are a part of a, of a supply chain, right? And those cattle are going to a feed yard that is leveraging this tool as well, right? That data follows that animal, okay? And, you know, Ian mentioned before, you know, we're not talking, these supply chains, we're not talking about vertically integrating the beef industry. I mean, you could go into a whole hour long podcast around the, the benefits of that potentially, the downsides, the difficulties, all that kind of thing. What this is, is vertical collaboration. and. The problem that the commercial cattleman has now, in my opinion, is this thing, it's it's not vertically integrated, which is fine, but because of that, it's so disjointed that information gets lost every time, right? Those cattle go to the sale barn. All the information you generated up until the point when they went there is now lost, okay? And then when they go to the backgrounder and they go into the feed yard, that information falls through the cracks and falls through the cracks. And you can never take that data and use it to make full circle decisions. Well, you leverage a tool like Breeder where all of that stays with that one animal, where it goes, all the way to carcass data. Everyone who is invested in that system can leverage that data to whatever degree the individual parties would share it, right? To help, once again, it's kind of like it's vertically integrated, except ownership and management isn't. It's just vertically integrating the flow of data, right? I mean, is that a fair way to put that in? To yeah, help definitely. All get better. And you know, at a ranch level, yeah, it's inventory, ranch management, genetics, genomics, if you want to do it, like all that can be stored against the animal. At a feed yard, it's a animal health and inventory management, pen writing app, you know, for people to log what meds are doing. We're not a feeding system. There's plenty of good feeding systems out there already. And we work with other feeding systems that have individual animal tracking as well so that they can get, as the animals come off the cow-calf operation, that can actually go into the feed yard system so they have some of that information ready to go. You know, you don't have to create an animal it's already created for you. So, you know, the ability to link that um, and make it seamless, like really when you think about it, like it's done on pen and paper and Excel spreadsheets, 90% of the industry at the moment. And how do that just gets lost? And, you know, how do we make that save time for everyone, improve the insights they're getting and, and really collaborate through that supply chain? And yeah, at the heart of it, it's a really, you know, we've got to be better than pen and paper, you know? Otherwise, there'll be a lot of phones thrown against a wall. So, you know, we have to be very careful to make sure it's super simple to use. Well, and I will attest that it is simple to use. And uh, actually, one of my uh, one feature I really appreciate about it is the alert feature. If you've got to retreat something or just go check something and see how it's doing, it's nice to have that reminder pop up as well. But there's a lot of cool things about it. So as we wrap up our conversation here today, even though I think the three of us could talk for maybe the rest of the day, but I don't think anyone wants to listen to a podcast that long. What, what are your final thoughts you want to share? I mean, if those, if there's one thing you want listeners to take away from this conversation, what is that? I'd like to hear from both of you. Yeah, I'll go first. Like I'm so long on the beef industry at the moment. Like it's, you know, there's so much out there for us to continue to improve for producers to continue to improve you know, the start of sustainability is commercial sustainability. And, you know, we have to be able to be commercially sustainable as beef producers um, so that we can do everything else that society wants us to achieve. And, you know, I think with the things we're talking about, be it supply chains or data or, you know, the ability to continually improve at a much more rapid rate, you know, there are just so many things exciting. And, and my last thoughts, just be curious, right? Try things. We've been pioneers and innovators for years in this industry we've been independent in how we do that but you know there's a lot of as it moves into sort of this data world sometimes it's a bit foreign to people but there's a lot of people out there to help you guide you through it and i think you know be interested and and we're here to have a conversation like this and you know doesn't have to be your path but a conversation never hurts and i think that's a great place to start yeah i'll make two comments the first one is 
I, I firmly believe that, and I'm not going to put time on it, you know, next five, 10, 15 years, the industry is going to move towards more and more supply chain like arrangements, like what we're talking about with breeder that, that are, the story is consistent. The data is consistent from the seed stock producer all the way to the retailer. I think you're going to start to see more and more retailers want that and it become kind of a sought after thing. Right. And I, I've actually talked with some outfits that, you know, say, hey, you know, sale barns, sale barn activity is going to decrease over time. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. That's just their opinion. Right. But so I think supply chains are, are what the industry is going to move toward in the future. And the, the other, if you want to call it a hill I'm willing to die on is that genomics is going to be a revolutionary tool to help us improve our efficiency in the beef industry in the United States. Um, and, you know, you can talk all, all day long about costs and, you know, how, right now for us to do it, it's, it's $40 for an animal. And you look at someone and, they're, and they can say, well, man, that's really, really expensive. You're right. Except here's what I know for a fact, because we've studied it. That $40 has a potential return on investment of nine to one. You do this right and you bring yourself in the scenario like the case study I showed you earlier where we've seen a 20% genetic improvement. The return on the investment there in three years is like six to one. It's a complete no brainer if you're in this for the long haul. And Ian's right. It's going to continue to get more affordable. And we're going to continue to be able to, to share more granular tests with people that are only worried about certain traits. And it, to, to me, is the way of the future. And the longer people wait to get behind it, the farther behind, I'm afraid that they're going to fall. Um, as supply chains, like the, you know, the one that we're actively working on between breeder and Jorgensen line and cattle, those are going to start to move ahead while others don't genomically. And I, that is a hill I will, I, will, I will talk for hours and days of, of, and supporting my position on that. And he has. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really appreciate each of you being on this podcast today and the conversations you've shared. Um, I'll be sure to include links to your websites down in the show notes. And with that, I think that wraps up our conversation. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank Alrighty, folks. Well, that's a wrap on that one. Thanks for sticking with us for this a little bit longer of an episode, but very much one that was engaging and valuable every second. Now, there are links in the, in the description if you are interested in learning more about Breeder. And additionally, I would really love to hear your thoughts on what you learned from this episode, what additional questions you have, or what your experiences are with um, this beef supply chain conversation. So you can best message me by either messaging me on socials. My socials are cattle convos. That's my handle. Or you can head to my website, casualcattleconversations.com. I know it's a tongue twister and a long one, but there is a contact us button there. And if you message me, it goes straight to my email. So with that, be sure to let me know your thoughts. Check out those links in the show notes and have a great rest of your day. Happy ranching, folks. <laughs>